going to come back and then we're going to be talking about what happens to these people that did go to jail and how that fits in with um, uh, some of the sentences and the guide guidelines and the slave trade in America actually. Mm -hmm. And so to be really informed as a uh, person on the jury, not only do you change the life of the person you convict, it, it just affects everybody, the family, the children, right. the children become orphans um, and so on and so on. And then that's why it is important that they are informed and stay, like you said, become Superman, just become Superman. Um, yeah. Lillian, may I, I uh, talk about the one book we haven't talked about yet? Sure. This, uh, this one, it's called Vote Scam, The Stealing of America, just very briefly. These are two brothers who wrote it, Jim and Ken Collier. They're both journalists, and they were involved in the political process, running a political campaign many years ago uh, in the early 1970s in Florida. They kind of stumbled across a massive amount of jury fraud, or excuse me, v uh, not jury fraud, sorry, voting fraud in Dade County, Florida. And that prompted them to investigate vote fraud farther. And the book is a fascinating book to read. It's like a detective story. But the reason this book is important from the jury aspect is we have always been told that the way the people participate is by voting at the ballot box. This is how the people have their say. But if the Collier brothers are right that there is massive vote fraud, which they call vote scam in their mm -hmm. book in this country. It may mean that in some instances the jury vote is the only vote the people have left that really counts. Speaking of counting, I'll quote Joseph Stalin here, not a very good person, but sometimes uh, he w had a, a uh, truthful idea. He said, it is not the people who vote who count. It is the people who count the votes who count. Yeah. And with the vote counting machinery becoming more and more hidden in this country, it is no longer paper ballots being counted at a local courthouse. We're having voting machines, mm -hmm. uh, computer terminal type voting. The count is done somewhere far away. It's subject to all kinds of manipulations. It's something that people cannot see how it's being done. The opportunities for fraud are enormous. Mm -hmm. Contrast that with the jury vote. You are with the other 11. You've lived with this case, and when that verdict is read, you know whether that's your verdict or not. If that verdict that's read in court is not your verdict, you can jump right up and, you know, lower heaven and raise hell about it. You have an immediate remedy there. But with your ballot box vote, you have no idea if your vote is going for the guy you voted for, for the other guy or gal, or floats off into cyberspace and it makes no difference because the count was actually drawn up beforehand. The numbers were decided beforehand by the powers that be. Okay, uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, let's go to a case of uh, your choice. Well, I guess I'll talk about the Fugitive Slave Act. Okay. Historically, that was a pretty fascinating law that was passed that said you couldn't harbor a runaway slave and you couldn't be a runaway slave. Slaves were viewed as property, of course. Well, the jury really did a number on the Fugitive Slave Act because juries did not like that law. And when slaves were brought, brought to trial, they often nullified the law. They said, yes, this slave is a slave from X plantation, and the slave did run away, you are a runaway slave, you filled all the criteria, you've met the elements of the statute, but you have a right to seek your freedom and we're not gonna find you to be a criminal because you've done that. And on the reverse side of things, if you harbored a runaway slave, the jury would very often say, well, you worked in what was called the Underground Railroad yeah. and that's illegal and you can't do that. And a lot of times these were ministers. These were p people of strong conviction. And they'd say, we're not going to find you to be a criminal because you're doing what you consider to be morally correct. Yeah. And so it was because of jury verdicts of acquittal mm -hmm. that the Fugitive Slave Act became a nullity. Yeah, that's usually what happens, you know, if, if something works. <laughs> yeah. 
Any thoughts on, on yes. anything like that? I would like to talk about two cases and uh, recent cases. Let's take one at a time. We're almost at the end. So We're almost at the end. So okay. Pretty, pretty close. So let's do one at a time. I would like to talk about Dr. Jack Kevorkian in Michigan. He is well known as the euthanasia doctor. Mm -hmm. He helps people who are terminally ill and in great pain to die with dignity. But unfortunately, doctor-assisted suicide in Michigan is illegal. Even though about two-thirds of the American public, uh, when they've been polled, say that they would like the option, they don't know if they would want to do it, but they would like the option to be helped to a dignified death in certain circumstances. So there is some public support for what jo Dr. Vorkin has done. He has been tried in the past several times and was acquitted by juries. And the newspapers and the legal commentators and even the judges pretty well agreed that this was jury nullification because he had clearly violated the law. And he testified that he had helped people to die. And the juries just felt that in this instance the law should be set aside. He was recently convicted, is last year, about this time yeah. in the spring. And the difference in that case is mainly that the judge decided to control the evidence more tightly. In the past, relatives of the deceased would testify and exactly. say the deceased man was in such pain and he begged to die. And we had to find Dr. Kevorkian. We asked him, the man who died mm -hmm. or the woman asked him, and Kevorkian is like an angel of mercy and helped us. This is powerful in front of a jury. Every one of them, I mean, uh, many of the people who died had cancer. Cancer is growing in our society. Almost everybody in the jury knows somebody or may have a relative who has cancer or had cancer. The suffering is well known and personally experienced by many people. So uh, to hear that would sway them to, to acquit the man. But instead, the judge kept all of that out. All that was there was the law and Kevorkian admitting that he had helped the person to die, and then that's it. The case is shut down. No more. No facts that would evoke emotion or evoke conscience in the jury. And he was acquitted, uh, convicted, convicted, convicted time, yeah. and sentenced to prison. He's an aged man. He may die in prison. A tragedy. Do, and it's a tragedy because the evidence was kept from the jury, and they were not told about their power to, to vote their conscience. Do I have time for one more case? I, I don't know. Um, or are we getting I, close? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Another case, and here has a, a better ending than, than that case, is the case of Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski in Texas. M some people may know, especially people that follow uh, medicine, uh, that Dr. Kevorkian is, the, uh, excuse me, Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski, a Polish doctor who came to the United States, is the inventor of a treatment called antineoplastins for brain cancer. It is very effective has no side effects. And many suffering people have come to him, they brought their children to him, and even though he had a, a license from the FDA to treat people under certain FDA guidelines, he was forbidden to treat people from outside the state of Texas if they came. Yeah. But people come suffering and they begged him. And so he treated people and they lived. I mean, his success rate is just phenomenal with brain mm -hmm. cancer, inoperable yeah. brain cancer. And the FDA prosecuted him and tried to put him in prison for 300 years. There have been uh, uh, hearings in Congress about this. They tried him twice. The first case was a hung jury. The jury could not agree. Mm -hmm. And the second case, the jury acquitted him of all charges. Thank God for juries. Mm -hmm. The man is still able to treat people and save people today. And because the juries did the right thing, what they did was they said, even though we have these laws that give the FDA the power to control medicine, we're going to set that aside, set the FDA's power aside, and we're going to save this doctor. He's done nothing wrong. Hope you uh, got something out of this. What happens is next week we're going to continue with a show called Prison for Profit, where we continue um, with this type of conversation. And on top of that, uh, we will um, uh, give you something to think about. And uh, I have an alien on my head, I know. It was a very serious subject, but just so you know, is there is a law on the book that um, you, we are not allowed to talk to aliens or communicate with their craft. It's a federal crime, and um, we could actually be arrested. See you next week with, with uh, another show, Prison for Profits. Bye. Swendy working on the new version of Lillian Miss Lillian.
Thank you. Love you. 